Borat TV. The world is thinking. It's now my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Jose Casanova is professor of sociology and senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University, where he heads the program on religion, globalization, and the secular. Prior to joining Georgetown's faculty, Professor Casanova was professor of sociology at the New School for Social Research. He has published widely in the areas of social theory, religion, politics, transnational migration, and globalization. His best known work, Pub Public Religions in the Modern World, is a classic in the field and has been translated into six languages. He is a member of the SSRC Advisory Committee for Religion and International Affairs and has held visiting appointments at NYU, at the Harriman Institute, at Columbia, and at the Central European University in Budapest, among many other institutions. Tariq Mudud is Professor of Sociology, Politics, and Public Policy and the founding director of the Center of Ethnicity, for the study of ethnicity and citizenship at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. He is also a founding co-editor of the international interdisciplinary journal Ethnicities and a founding co-editor of the Paul Grade Politics of Citizenship and Identity uh, book series. Having worked in racial equality on policy, uh, eight racial equality policy post, Tariq is a regular contributor to media and policy debates in Britain. He was awarded an MBA, I'm sorry, MBE, I don't know about an MBA, <laughs> but an MBE by the Queen for Service to Social Science and Ethnic Relations. And in 2001 was elected a member of the UK Academy of Social Science. Aristide Zolberg is the Walter Eberstadt Professor of Political Science and Historical Studies at the New School for Social Research, where he is also an associate member of the Department of Sociology. Previously, he taught at Wisconsin at the University and the University of Chicago. He has also held visiting appointments at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Vienna, the Salzburg Seminar, the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, the European Institute in Florence, and the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Science, and Humanities at Cambridge. Professor Zolberg is the author of a great many books, including A Nation by Design, Immigration Policy, and the Fashioning of America, and how many exceptionalisms, explorations, and comparative macroanalysis. Our moderator for the evening is Chase Robinson, who was appointed the Graduate Center's Provost and Senior Vice President in September 2008. He is also a distinguished professor of history here at the Graduate Center and one of the world's leading authorities on early Islamic history. Before joining us at the Graduate Center, uh, a decision that we were delighted about, as you can imagine. Dr. Robinson taught at Oxford, where he was professor of Islamic history and fellow of Wolfson College. He has held fellowships from the British Academy, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and the American Research Center in Cairo. His work has been supported by <coughs> grants from the Lever Hume Trust, the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the British Academy. Provost Robinson, the floor, sir, is yours. President Kelly, thank you very much. Um, welcome to you in our audience. I'm, I'm grateful that you've all found the time to, to come this evening. Uh, I'm especially, of course, grateful to our speakers who've made time in their very busy schedules to participate in what I, uh, I'm sure will be a very interesting and I hope provocative discussion. One or two words by way of introduction. It's probably about 1989. I haven't discussed this with my, with my colleagues here on the stage. But perhaps it was in 1989 with the publication of Rushdie's Satanic Verses that uh, the West became aware of the fact that uh, Islam and integration might have real political and cultural significance. That was the year in which the book was not only published, but of course the year in which there were some fierce responses on the part of at least some of the more vocal members of Muslim communities in the UK and elsewhere. Subsequently, a series of events, one thinks of 9-11, one thinks of the Madrid bombings in March of 2004, one thinks of the London bombings in July of 2005. Events such as those have brought into even clearer focus that we have a, a number of, of issues that seem interrelated, issues such as Islam, integration, citizenship, 
how one balances the rights of religious communities in general, not just Muslim ones, with those values of liberal societies. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in February of 2008, suggested, and he was um, roundly <laughs> criticized in some circles for having done so, that perhaps elements of Sharia might be considered an alternative uh, within the British legal framework. So we have a very topical event. We have a significant event. It's one that I'm grateful to uh, 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 my colleagues here on the stage for, for helping us understand. It might be useful to start to think about some definitions and some terms. We're all aware that Islam is a religion, of course. Um, but what we understand by religion sometimes um, doesn't command uh, uh, complete support or assent. Uh, it's not clear, for instance, the degree to which one can think of religion as separate of culture or part of culture. To what extent is religion portable? To what extent does it matter when a believer moves? Does he bring or does she bring a religious tradition with him or her? To what extent does he or she invent one? So perhaps we could start by thinking a little bit about immigration, emigration, and um, beyond a definition that would posit that, that uh, migration is the movement, be it interstate or intrastate, <coughs> of peoples, what can we say with a bit more precision? So perhaps we can start, Ari, with just uh, some, some broad overview of the history, at least in the 20th century, of immigration in the United States with particular reference to religion. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor as well as a pleasure to be here tonight. I often come to the Graduate Center, which has really become one of the liveliest intellectual centers in New York City in the last few years. So it's really a pleasure to be here instead of listening, part, although I'll be listening to my colleagues, to also get a chance to speak. Uh, in response to your question, Immigration has been, in many societies, sort of a major contributor to, uh, to sort of greater diversity, racial, ethnic, linguistic, as well as religious. And we have to remember, uh, for one thing, it sort of reveals the arrival of different people, reveals to, to the receiving society what it's sort of things that it didn't necessarily take very seriously. For example, the United States took itself very much as a, as a sort of a religiously diverse society until Roman Catholics started arriving uh, in, the, uh, in the 1830s in large numbers. And Samuel F.B. Morse, besides inventing the telegraph, wrote vociferously about the arrival of Catholics. And he was sure that uh, within a few years the Pope would move to, to New York City. That hasn't happened yet, <coughs> but it could maybe. And uh, I don't think much, much needs to be said about what happened when, when Jews started moving from Eastern Europe in large numbers to both Western Europe and to the United States. That's when the Protocol of the Elders of Zion was invented in response to this, this danger. So I think uh, the fact that Islam is sort of a, dis a disturbance is, re is by no means a unique phenomenon in relation to immigration. But I think, uh, if I may, I just want to add a couple of words about why it is that religion, that uh, diverse religious di diversity is such a, such a traumatic kind of event for the receiving society. Because religion, although it is, I mean, it's not just a private matter, it, it's inherently a public affair. People need places of worship so that, uh, for example, Muslims need mosques. And as you probably know, the presence of a mosque and a muezzin uh, who doesn't ring a bell, but uh, a call to prayer, it's, it's a public event which the Swiss, for example, find very disturbing recently. And uh, things like that. Uh, so that uh, religion has an, inher an inherently... Uh, public uh, dimension. People eat different things. Uh, uh, for example, in the United States, the word kosher is not totally familiar to everybody. And halal is very similar to that. 
but it still comes as, as a surprise that uh, people won't eat certain things. Although in the United States, it, over time, it's really become a sort of a taken for granted. It's not, it's not a disturbance. But in France, it's a, which also uh, emphasizes secularization. The fact that people want to insist on not eating pork, for example, in school lunches and things like that, is viewed as, a, as, a, as interfering with, uh, with, secular, with secularism. Even though French schools still s tend to serve uh, fish on, on Friday, it's no longer a requirement of, of the Catholic Church except during Lent. And in France, it's considered not to be a religious fact, but, but rather just a French tradition. And, uh, but if you examine where the tradition comes from, it's pretty obvious. So I think uh, we have to keep these things in mind. Uh, this is, uh, Islam is uh, the most recent version of this, but it's by no means a unique phenomenon. Tarek, do, do, you, do you agree with the proposition that, that one of the functions of immigration is to, is to make the home, uh, the host country, the, the receiving nation, more alert to these differences as, as Ari is suggesting? Yes, well, I, I would like to say that it's a, a privilege and an honor to be here too. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Uh, it's my, actually my first visit um, to your university, and I'm very um, pleased to be here, as I say. I, I think that just as Ari has emphasized the historical context for current fears and concerns, um, we, we have a very, you know, similar history, similar and different, of course, in, in Britain. You'll know that um, Britain, in particular England, isn't a particularly religious country, by which I mean people don't wear their religion on their sleeve, or very few people do. But interestingly enough, migrants do tend to wear religion on their sleeves when they arrive, especially. So, Virtually every migrant group that has come to the British Isles in the last, say, 150 years has been more religious and more visibly religious than what one might call the native population, than um, British people. This is true of some of the groups that Ari was mentioning. Irish Catholics, definitely so. <coughs> um, Jewish people from Eastern Europe, yes. Um, and more recently, it's true of Hindus, Sikhs, as well as Muslims from South Asia and the Middle East and so on. And it's true of black Caribbean people. And amongst the most recent migrants, it's true of black Africans, who are mainly Christians, and Poles. We the, about the largest migration in the shortest period of time we've had is from Poland in the last 10 years. Um, People don't know the exact figures because they're members of the European Union and records aren't kept. But it's estimated that um, the figure is probably in excess of a, of a million. And uh, I can't remember the exact year, but Poland only joined the European uh, Union uh, less than a decade ago. So it was a very rapid uh, influx, and they are church going Catholics, unlike the majority of the people that they settle amongst. And one of the uh, things that's happened recently <coughs> that uh, I, I noticed a statistic came out is that counting Christians in London, you know, not just our capital city, but easily our most populous city of 8 million people, um, black people who are less than 10% of the population of London now amount to constitute more than half of churchgoers in the city. 53% was the figure uh, a couple of years ago. And the question is then, what happens? Well, the historical experience so far is that migrants, both in their own generation, but certainly their children and their grandchildren, gradually come to approximate to the rest of the population, you know, give or take a, a few orthodox, ultra-orthodox sects. And who knows, that may happen with, with Islam. It's, it's far too early to tell. I'm not predicting it, and it may go the other way. And there are some indications, if people want uh, indications, that it could go another way. 
I was involved in a, a national <coughs> survey uh, in England uh, in the 1990s. We collected the data in the middle of the 1990s of uh, ethnic minorities. So that's not just migrants, it includes um, people born in, in Britain, but you know, of uh, migrant stock. Non-white uh, uh, people, people outside, coming from outside Europe. And we found that uh, using a few measures like um, what people said about how important religion was to them, but also a couple of behavioral measures like attendance at place of worship and so on, that ethnic minorities, all of them, you know, black or from South Asia, Christians, Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims, all of them were considerably more religious than the white population. But what was interesting was that over time, they became less religious by those measures, uh, questions about how important religion is to you in your life and attendance at place of worship. But at the same time, there was another sociological fact, nothing to do with migration, and that is, at least it's true in Britain, I wouldn't be surprised it's also true in the United States, is that people become more religious as they become older. Mm. Mm. So we had two countervailing trends. You had migrants coming very religious, and their religion kind of, as it were, mellowing over time because they were becoming like the rest of the population, but they were aging. And as they were aging, they were becoming more religious. So doing some uh, logistic regression, we found that with nearly all the groups, you had basically a kind of equilibrium that age and what we might call religious assimilation worked in opposite directions, but more or less balanced each other out, mm -hmm. counter-checked. But some more recent data, not collected by me, and not, you know, not on such a large scale and not so systematic, but nevertheless, uh, some data specifically about Muslims found, this is more recent data, that amongst Muslims, the younger they were, the more, as it were, Islamic they were. The element of Islamic consciousness, the desire to display being a Muslim, through uh, dress and through behavior and through um, uh, regular attendance at a, a mosque, especially for a, for a man, and um, you know, <coughs> saying that Muslim identity was important to them. Now, of course, as we all know, there's an enormous kind of political pressure on Muslims in Britain at the moment. Um, it's partly connected, obviously, with, um, you know, the war, uh, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, international terrorist networks, and of course we've had um, bombings in London and elsewhere and uh, various attempts that, you know, thank goodness um, were stopped in time, didn't come off or whatever. So th there are, you know, definitely a, a security issue as well. So Muslims find themselves under all kinds of pressure, people complaining about Muslims, people frightened about Muslims, and any minority, nothing to do with religion, any minority that has that kind of pressure put upon it becomes much more aware of its own identity and tries to project its identity um, through a kind of defiant confidence, a reactive defiance. You know, you think we're terrorists. Well, actually, we're not, and we're proud to be Muslims. Mm. We won't go around hiding our Islam. And I think that's exactly where we are in Britain at the moment. Jose, the patterns that, that Tarek is describing that are particular to the UK, to, to what extent do they, can they also be said to describe what's gone on elsewhere in, in continental Europe, or for that matter, the United States? One is attracted on the basis of, of, of the two points raised so far to the proposition that perhaps the United States is, uh, is, has higher degrees of religiosity because it has a more consistent pattern of immigration. Um, certainly that must be an oversimplification, but how does one tease out the relationship between religiosity and, and immigration within a comparative framework so that we can understand how Islam fits into, in, in, in broadly speaking? Like my colleagues, I would also like to uh, say that it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here today, especially with very, very uh, uh, good and distinguished colleagues. Um, Yes, the comparison, the comparative dimension is important. The United States has, of course, both a long history of immigration, 
in a long history of religious pluralism, of accommodating both accommodating immigrants and accommodating religious pluralism. But of course, at first, this religious pluralism was internal within Protestantism. It was Protestant denominationalism, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, etc. It was the big challenge was to incorporate Catholic into the system and then to incorporate Jews into the system. Once you have incorporated Catholics and Jews, you can incorporate anybody. And to a certain extent, <laughs> to a certain extent, it's happening today with Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, etc. Now, of course, Muslims in the United States were almost invisible prior to September 11 because it was a very small immigrant group. It was extremely diverse. They were relatively uh, uh, upper mobile. I mean, they were integrated professionally. They live in basically in the suburbs, more in the inner city. So it was only September 11 that made Muslims visible in America. They were not visible as immigrants. Except for African-American Muslims. Well, exactly. And also because Islam in America, like in Europe, you have a large proportion, of course, of Muslims that were not immigrants, but they were precisely converts to Islam. So you have the, the, the identification of Islam and immigration, which is great in Europe, was not the case in the United States. Now, when it comes to continental Europe, Great Britain is somewhere in between. It had also a long history of immigration because of the Irish and the empire, and also much more religious pluralism than continental Europe. Continental Europe is basically societies of without religious pluralism. The confessional boundaries were basically fixed in the 16th century. So you have all of Northern Europe is homogeneous Lutheran, all of Southern Europe homogeneously Catholic, and in between you have biconfessional societies, Holland, Germany, Switzerland, which are both Calvinist and Catholic. And these boundaries remain so for 300, 400 years until basically they disappear because of secularization. So it is in this context then that new immigrants come in now, it is important to recognize that the principle cuius regio eius religio, that the religion of the prince, of the king, of the monarch, is the religion of the subjects, has remained basically valid in Europe. And interesting enough, even when sovereignty changed from the monarch to the people with the French Revolution, there was no change in religious pluralism. Or when democracy was expanded to universal suffrage, there was no change in religious pluralism. The only dynamic in European societies has been unchurching. People live in the churches, not converting to other religions. So in this context, then, of course, you have uh, societies that had no immigration, and suddenly you have... <laughs> I'm very sorry. I well, never... Nobody calls me. That's the Pope. <laughs> the Pope calling. He's going to move to New York, according to... I'm very sorry. <laughs> My son reminded me to tell my cell phone off. I never <laughs> use it. <clears throat> so the question is, when immigrants began arriving in the 60s in Europe, it was first as labor immigrants, guest workers, guest arbiters. They were not meant to stay. They were meant to work and then go back home. Obviously, they stayed, they brought their families. And it happened first, many of those were from Southern Europe, Italy, Greece, Spain, those were to a certain extent either accommodated, integrated, or they returned to their countries. It was the Turks, the North Africans, that really, really then stay and have created this, this, this new situation, this condition. But uh, it is important, I remember, I studied in Germany, I worked in Germany. In the 1960s, 1970s, there were only Turks in Germany, there were no Muslims. Today there are only Muslims, no Turks. So it, something has happened in the way in which we denominate each other. If we use the idea of denominationalism, the way we recognize each other as groups, and the model of mutual recognition through religious identities in the United States, which is a positive uh, process, in uh, Europe, this denominationalism is linked to fundamental conflicts between Christian and secular Europe and those who are neither Christian nor are secular. Mm. And this is kind of the dynamic in Europe that Christianity and secularity are almost synonymous, and those people are neither Christian nor secular. And this is so. That's, let's follow that up a little bit, how these Turks became Muslims, as it were, um, by thinking, having set the scene, by uh, defining very broadly immigration and religion, by focusing a little bit on Islam. Um, when one speaks of Islam and, and immigration, one is implicitly assuming 
that this subject, Islam, is exercising some agency over these immigrants. And that's why we call them Muslim immigrants, after all, or how is it that the Turks became Muslims? Um, but to what extent does that presuppose a kind of monolithic background, an Islam uh, that they all share, despite the fact that these uh, immigrants may come from, uh, from North Africa, from the Middle East, from South Asia, or elsewhere? Um, to what extent does the cultural baggage that they carry represent such distinct national cultures that it's meaningless to speak of, uh, of Islam as any important uh, uh, variable in the way that they are um, defining themselves, um, again, relative to these, what can be powerful national cultures. Let me put the question to you, Tarek. Mm -hmm. You've written that uh, religion is, quote, usually considered by social scientists to be an aspect of culture, but it continues to be uniquely held by some to be an aspect of social life that must be kept separate from the state, maybe from politics in general, and perhaps even from public affairs at large. So to restate my question, to what extent is religion separable from culture so yeah. that one can... Well, beginning with the issue about homogeneity and heterogeneity, you know, what is Islam? Are, are, you know, is it a, a single thing that all Muslims are, as it were, carrying in their head or some other part of their body? Um, well, of course, Muslims are very diverse, like any religious group of people or any group of people at, at all. Um, and this is certainly true in, in Britain and in Western Europe, to such an extent that um, it's only very recently that you've even got mosques in, in Britain, and there are over a thousand mosques in Britain, that are non-ethnic mosques. Otherwise, most mosques, and this is certainly true of <coughs> virtually all mosques, apart from the very big ones, say, in London and one or two others outside London, um, they belong to a local community, and the local community will be Pakistani, or Bangladeshi, or uh, Iraqi, or Turkish, and so on. Um, and you go there, and you're likely to just find a mono-ethnic group of Muslims in there. Um, now, it, services are likely to be much more, when I say services, I mean, you know, the khutbah, the, the speech from the imam, are much more likely to be in English, but otherwise it could have been in Urdu, in a Pakistani mosque, in uh, a Bengali, in a Bangladeshi mosque, and so on. And you find relatively little intermarriage, just as there was a time when, you know, Polish Catholics didn't marry Italian Catholics in the United States, and then they came to do so. So, but having said that, I, I think it would be wrong to underestimate um, the presence of some kind of Muslim consciousness or solidarity. But it's not just to do with the Islam of scriptures and the Islam of religiosity. It is um, to do with people, people's sense that they are all in the same corner or a sense that, you know, we are a people. Um, and so talk... Uh, especially amongst young people, of the Ummah, the Muslim global community, is much more common now than it, than it used to be. And I think your question about how did Turks become Muslims in Germany, well, if you ask a similar question in Britain, part of the answer, I'd say the, a very large part of the answer, is because Muslims made it so. And you mentioned, actually, in your introduction, the event that was, if you like, the initiatory, the foundational event, the battle against the novel Satanic Verses. Suddenly, all these people emerged out of the woodwork and the provincial woodwork because there were mainly Pakistanis and Bangladeshis who were not predominantly in London but much more uh, provincially distributed. Suddenly, they emerged because they were angry about the novel and they said they were Muslims, though originally other people were describing them as Asians or black or immigrants or whatever. So we mustn't lose that element of Muslim agency. But it's not necessarily a, a religious agency. It's actually not very dissimilar from ethnic group agency, which, of course, also is political and is a reaction to inequality and oppression and so on. So if just as at a particular moment of time, uh, African-Americans came together and said, yes, we are black and we have 
a political set of demands that we're willing to unite around, despite all our other differences, whether they be regional, class, other kinds of differences, including religion. So similarly, Muslims, just like other uh, groups, ethnic groups or religious groups, or ethno-religious groups, that may be the most accurate way of thinking about it, ethno-religious groups, they uh, come together not because they are homogeneous, but they come together because, as it were, they believe that circumstances dictate it. And that's what's really happened. And British society, on the whole, much more so than actually our continental European neighbors, accepted the idea of giving some political space to ethnic difference, to some assertion of difference, perhaps not quite as much as in the United States, but you know, following the kind of the, the identity politics movements that asserted difference based on gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, and so on. Certainly, that had a, a very strong uh, echo in, in Britain. And you can see, in the 1990s, Muslims as a kind of people catching up on the identity movement, people asserting, yes, respect us as Muslims. Don't dismiss us as black or Asian or something that we're not. We will assert our own identity, and we expect not to have to hide our identity, but we want it out there in the public space. But a lot of people are nervous about that because they say, ah, oh, but religion, that's not supposed to be in the public space. To, to what extent is this distinctly Islamic, Jose? To, to what extent the sense of solidarity, the I mean, sense of... Catholics mm -hmm. in the United States. Of course, they were Irish, they were Poles, they were Italians. They had a lot of nothing in common, all kinds of Catholics. But they became Catholics here vis-a-vis -vis the Protestants. It was because the Protestants viewed them as Catholics as the other that they actually reasserted their Catholic identity. So it's a dynamic relationship between groups that made the Catholics truly Catholics. Look, the same Italians from the Mezzogiorno that went to Milan and Torino and they became anarchists there. Mm. They never became Catholic. Right. From the same villages, they went to Argentina and the same thing. Everybody was Catholic there, so their Catholic identity was not important. They became Catholics in Boston, in New York, in Philadelphia, in a way which they were not in, in southern Italy. So the, but of course, this is a particular American phenomenon, how the immigrants assume their religious identity because of the relation of, of dynamism. So again, in Europe, it's also a dynamic process. It's not only, I would argue, let's say, these events, like the satanic verses, or, but it is a dynamic process of relationship, and it has to do also with the global processes. A kind of global denominationalism is taking place in which people view themselves. I mean, Muslims and, and, and Hindus that were, let's say, in Durban, South Africa together as colored people, and they had lived for generations together, suddenly they have purified their identities and have basically uh, uh, been separated from one another. The same thing happened with, with uh, 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 South Indians in, in, in Trinidad or in Guyana, uh, Muslims and Hindus living together, being the same political parties in the same trade unions, but now they are separating themselves. So there is a global process also in which those religious identities are taking a greater uh, um, weight than it was probably 30, 40 years ago. Let me jumble up some of the categories by drawing on something that, that you and a colleague have written, Ari. You've argued that Islam in Europe and Spanish in the United States are, quote, metonyms for the dangers that those most opposed to immigration perceive as looming ahead. In, in what respect, how is it that you can compare language with religion? Well, uh, the simple thing is that uh, the presence of the other defines an identity because identity has a positive aspect, but it always has a negative aspect. That's the, uh, that's the argument uh, that uh, Longlit Woon and I developed in that particular article, which was based on the work of a, a Norwegian uh, anthropologist and the notion of boundaries having this positive and negative aspect. I think it applies to Islam uh, for the reason my colleague just uh, elaborated. I mean, Muslims are people who uh, eat differently and who celebrate different holidays. So the fact that they are there and that they do these things defines the, what we are. And what we are is what they're not. 
So there is this kind of there's a sort of dialectic interaction between these between the positive and the negative. And I think a similar kind of thing happens with uh, with language. I mean, I, I I was born and grew up in Belgium, which is a bilingual country in the same sense that Switzerland is a trilingual country. And Belgians can really make a great deal about being either French or Dutch speaker, speakers. And uh, so this works for, not only for religion, it works for language as well. And, and I think in the United States, um, because uh, there were times when, uh, when immigrants were defined by their, by their uh, religion, as I mentioned before. When, when the Irish came, they were Roman Catholic who came to, and it kind of emphasized the, uh, the Protestantism of the United States. And then uh, when Jews began to arrive, it, it emphasized the Christianity of the United States, just as it did in France and other, other European countries. So I think that uh, the fact that uh, immigrants have always spoken different languages when they arrive, uh, Norwegian or Yiddish or whatever. But uh, since, uh, since the arrival of Germans before independence, there has not been a time when so many, such a large proportion of immigrants spoke one language. So in that sense, Spanish has really become sort of a, identified with immigration and viewed as a threat and uh, the United St uh, Americans have become sort of have defined themselves as English speakers in relation to these new to these newcomers so in the United States uh, in the same sense that Christianity has become even in very secular countries like Britain or France has really become an identifier as against the Muslims in the United States uh, where people speak a variety of a variety of English, and sometimes speak a, a different language with their grand grandmother or whatever, who still speaks Yiddish or Italian, or or maybe not Italian but Sicilian. Uh, in that sense, uh, English has really become the identifier of Americans as against uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants. That's what that's what we had in mind as sort of a boundary marker. Let's try to focus in, shall we, on, on what the sociology of religion can tell us about the extent to which religion can either foster integration, which is one of the anxieties that, that many observers share, um, or discourage or prevent integration, which is a source of anxiety for a different group of people. Um, what are the circumstances? What, what, what accounts for the fact that sometimes religion seems to foster integration, while other times it seems that religious belief breaks integration and promotes uh, alienation or at least uh, differentiation. Jose, do you want to start it off? Of course, the question, the very question that religion either does that or that is problematic because it's never religion in the abstract, are particular religious groups in particular contexts. And, and so, but in general, one could say in the United States, we know that religion is a positive resource that people use to assert their Americanness. It is the more religious you are, the more American you prove you are, and at the same time, it allows you to be different. So religion was the kind of identity for immigrants that allowed them both to be different, but also to become increasingly more American, precisely through their religiosity. That's why it's not that the second generation becomes less religious in America. We know that actually immigrants become more religious in America the longer they are here. So they, all the groups, it happened, everybody was surprised, Germans, Italians, Poles, in the 19th century, it happens today to Hindus, to Muslims, to Buddhists. They say we are better Hindus here, we are, be we are better Buddhists, we are better Muslims here. So this is a, a unique American uh, aspect. Uh, you know, it was President Eisenhower who said, I don't care which religion Americans have, but they ought to have a religion. Right? And we know, for instance, that Americans lie to the pollsters, and when they ask how frequently, how religious they are, they say that they pray more frequently than they do, that they go to church more frequently than they do. So they really think that they ought to be religious, and they are ashamed of not being as religious as they ought to be. Now, why in America to be mother means to be religious, while in Europe it's the other way around? Mm. In Europe, to be mother means not to be religious. So their religion becomes a problem. 
not only because you are not Christian, but even because you are religious. So it is a, a, a kind of a situation in which the, the integration of other religions in Europe is much more difficult because of religious homogeneity and because of secularity. Mm. Because, and the combination of the two makes the integration of Muslims as Muslims much more difficult. Mm. Although, of course, we have to recognize there are fundamental uh, changes, differences. Germany, last week, they just uh, released this new study uh, uh, of the German uh, uh, Muslim Conference and basically indicates the progress that Germany has made. While a society like Holland, that 10 years ago seemed to be almost a model of integration, now it really is having tremendous problems with the integration of Muslims. And it is because of the dynamic of majority-minority. So again, it's always group dynamics and which kind of majority-minority uh, uh, kind of uh, relations take place. So you're suggesting is demographic change, which is the, the most important variable in, in, in determining that balance? The, well, I would say one cannot answer this question in general, in context. Why in Spain, for instance? Spain had uh, more victims of Muslim terrorism than any other European country, but after the Madrid bombings, there was no anti-Muslim reaction because we Spaniards are fighting with one another. <laughs> so we cannot be us versus them. So it was refracted to Basque terrorism. And there is no way that Spanish feminists are going to side with the Catholic Church against Muslims. Mm -hmm. So we are fighting, secularists and Catholics are fighting with one another, and the secularists actually protect the Muslims against the Catholics. So it's a very different dynamic uh, that takes place, let's say, in places where you have a coalition of the extreme right, the xenophobic right, the Christian center, the liberal uh, left, and the feminists, which is a coalition which happens across Europe in many countries. And so it is, whether th when those coalitions are possible, then Islam becomes the other, the foreign other, the religious other, and the traditional other against our modern liberal progressive uh, morality. Well, what about yes, I, I think there's a, a, um, a lot of truth in what Jose is saying, and I think, you know, just to kind of underline that for an American audience, it really is very different in Britain and the rest of Europe compared to uh, the United States. Um, in Britain, overt religion is seen as um, something rather vulgar and unwanted and uncouth. Mm. People who want to be civilized and assimilate and be good Brits should keep their religion to themselves mm. privately should not display it in streets and public places and should not ask local authorities to, you know, provide uh, halal food at school and things like that, even though, uh, you know, we have the same issue about fish on Sunday and, and, and many other things as well. Um, so it is very different. So religion is, if you take your religion seriously, if you prioritize it, uh, either in terms of religiosity or for the kind of the identity prioritization I was talking about, which even, you know, non-religious, non-believing Muslims uh, believe is important to them and so on. So it's not just to do with religiosity. But if it's religion, that's really regarded as a problem. So it's, it's not helpful towards what you might call integration because other people say, well, if you say you're Pakistani, we can do things for you. We can give you grants to build a community center. We can have uh, affirmative action to get you into jobs or to become a, a, a candidate for a political party, the Labour Party, and so on. But if you say you're a Muslim, well, what can we do? This isn't something you should be saying in public. You should be keeping this to yourself and your own community. But there's another dimension to your question, uh, whether religion is integrative or disintegrative, uh, or what the opposite of integrative is. And that is, I think, um, Robert Putnam's distinction between different kinds of social capital um, is helpful here when he talks about social capital, which is bonding because it brings a group of people together and helps them to bond because they look after each other, you know, they uh, trust each other, for instance, that they're willing to lend money to each other or, or they give each other time knowing that when they need it, others will give them time and so on. So in that sense, I think uh, religion and Islam in particular in Britain is definitely a integrative 
factor. But integrative with whom? Integrative with other Muslims. Mm. But if you mean, ah, integration across religious boundaries, so integration of Muslims with other people, well, no, this will have the opposite effect. Because if, if something integrates a group, it means it pulls them away from other possible connections, overlaps, and so on. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not an either-or. But you can see that you know, there is a tendency one way or the other. And I think Islam does have a little bit of that effect. But when we talk about integration, we should really um, be careful about what we're talking about. The real issues to do with integration are where do people live? And that's really to do with where can they afford to live? Mm. And where can they live where they feel safe? They're not going to live where they think there are uh, uh, racist uh, gangs and neighborhoods where they can't safely walk out of the street in the dark and so on. And they won't live in neighborhoods where, if they need to go to a mosque, a mosque isn't available, or other things that are important to their lives, whether it's clothes, food, meeting friends, and, and, and so on. So that is partly determined. So where people live is partly determined by economics, partly by security issues, partly by cultural needs, and, and so on. And the, in the United States, you seem to have um, embraced or accepted, tolerated, <coughs> Um, residential concentrations by ethnic group, by racial groups, and so on. Whereas in Britain, people feel uncomfortable about that. And so that's another thing that Muslims stand out, and it's a sore thumb. But the other dimension of integration is to do with, with politics. Um, if Muslims st are standing up for certain causes, which other people are not standing up for, then that is seen as a, a non-integrative thing. But as it happens, the single biggest integration thing that happened to Muslims and the rest of British society in the last decade is the invasion of Iraq. Because you'll remember that um, about two weeks before the start of that invasion, London saw a demonstration, the biggest demonstration London has ever seen in its streets. Two million people, it's estimated, walked in those streets, of which probably only a very small percent, you know, less than 5%, I would hazard a guess, were Muslims. But Muslims suddenly found themselves, for the first time, and perhaps the last time for a while anyway since this happened, suddenly part of the mainstream. They were protesting about the same things that other people are protesting about. So integration isn't just about religious beliefs or even religious dress and so on. It's uh, got to do with all the things like economics, politics, where you live, and so on. We've been speaking, obviously, about, about the power of religion. And were this conversation taking place a generation ago, it would be a very surprising discussion, given where the social sciences were a generation ago. I'll put a question to you, Jose, and then I'll turn to Ari for a response. You've written that the progressive, though highly uneven, secularization of Europe is an undeniable social fact. What do you mean by secularization? How, how do you? Um, how do you explain that secularization is an undeniable social fact, and yet we've spent now the better part of an hour talking about the power of religion for social change and integrating, uh, 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 or powers of integrating, or as you put it, disintegrating? Well, secularization in Europe means basically unchurching, mm -hmm. people leaving the churches. Because to be a member of the church was a confessional enforced identity, which everybody had to put up with for centuries. and so. Uh, uh, leaving the churches uh, appears to Europeans as a liberation mm. from an enforced identity. Uh, and this is part of what confessions are in Europe, as opposed to denominations, which are voluntary associations and the kind of relationship that groups have in the United States. So again, uh, secularization at this particular level of uh, a decline in beliefs and practices is a very widespread European phenomenon. In this sense, of course, there are many other uh, aspects of secularization having to do with basically privatization of religion, having to do with the very differentiation of religion as a sphere separate from the others. But in this respect, even in this respect in the United States, there are differences from the European pattern. Now, the experience indeed in Europe was that when people left the countryside, went to the large urban centers, people tended to be less religious 
than uh, they were before. In continental Europe, not in Great Britain, they also had a tradition of evangelical Christianity with industrial revolution, urban centers. But in much of Europe, this had been the case. So now what, what is the problem? It's not that Europe suddenly has become religious again. There is no evidence of religious revival. But re religion has become a serious, contentious public issue, partly having to do with immigration, but partly ha having to do also with the very process of expansion of the European Union. Each European country had its own model of church-state relations, how to deal with religion in the public sphere. Once they try to develop a European policy, there is no way that the French model is going to be adopted across Europe, or the Dutch model, or the Italian. So on religion, there can be no European rule, precisely because there are such great differences. So this has become a contentious issue. How are we going to have a European constitution? Should we mention God in the constitution or not? And what do we do with Turkey? Turkey is actually following the criteria we've given them. More and more, they appear to be ready to join. And yet, somehow, they cannot join because they are neither Christian nor secular. So there is a, a fundamental uh, um, also concerning secularization. Europeans thought that this model, their model was going to be the global model for all. And suddenly they realize now that they are rather the exception on this particular point, that the rest of the world is becoming both more secular and more religious at the same time, which of course models European categories. And so in this respect, uh, Europe is becoming much more aware of its uniqueness, uh, of how the rest of the world is very religious, and they become nervous about it. And then they also seem to uh, precisely blame religion for a lot of problems that actually Europe has had not because of religion, wars, conflicts, terrorism. I mean, 20th century Europe had all of those things, but had nothing to do with religion. And yet when, when Europe sees those problems around the world and somehow religion is related to it, they blame religion for it. And they remember the, the wars of religion of the 16th century, which now says, fortunately, we got rid of religion and we have no problems. But the people that have religion have still all these problems. So there is a fundamental way in which this secularization has been worked through in the European self-definition, what defines them vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, which is, again, it's very different from the American uh, pattern in this respect. All right, would you like to respond? In, 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 uh, yeah, I just like want to uh, emphasize the American pattern, which, uh, which I think is very different. And let me just use a very specific example. So the New York pattern, it's not the American pattern, but uh, the, of the accommodation, of, it shows both how it's possible to accommodate religion in the public sphere, but also how asserting religion can be a way of, in, of, of asserting in one's desire to integrate. Uh, when uh, I think it was in the 1960s, under, I forget which mayor, New York adopted the alternate side of the street parking system which is very important, part of everybody's life. <laughs> and uh, Orthodox Jews said, but we can't move our, uh, we can't move our, we can't drive on, on Jewish holidays. Jewish holidays were not recognized in New York. Uh, I mean, as in France, Christian holidays are public holidays, like Sunday. So you didn't have to move your car on Sunday. But Orthodox Jews uh, have uh, their own New Year's you know, and, and Yom Kippur, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and there were enough, enough Jews, even who were secular, but who sort of supported the assertion of Jewishness by these Orthodox Jews for purposes of parking, <laughs> at least. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really a very important part of everybody's life. <laughs> <laughs> so the, accom the accommodation was to uh, to proclaim uh, Jewish holidays also to be also uh, exempt from parking regulations. Once that, that was done, then, every, then the Catholics came around a couple of years later and said, we have special holidays too, uh, like the beginning of Lent and things like that, and some of the virgin holidays, August 15, the Assumption, things like that, which Protestants don't celebrate. But of course, there's nothing in either Vatican I or II which says that you can't drive your car. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Catholics said, but we're as good as Jews, so we should have, our holiday should be recognized. <laughs> then everybody else came along. Then uh, African-American con converts to Islam uh, demanded that their holidays be recognized. 
and uh, eventually uh, uh, <laughs> others. Uh, the, the most recent one that I know of is when Chinese New Year was recognized. <laughs> it's not even a religious holiday, but, <laughs> but the first Chinese was elected to the municipal, the municipal assembly. So he had enough clout to, to get the Chinese holiday recognized. So you don't have to, nobody has to, everybody can be Chinese on, on Chinese New Year's Day. <laughs> Jews, Muslims, Catholics, everybody. So the assertion of the, these identities is a way of, of getting, a, getting a voice in the system. And it doesn't hurt anybody. The only thing it does is to get the streets a little dirtier. <laughs> but everybody can gripe about that. It doesn't really hurt too much. <laughs> and the, uh, the street cleaners uh, don't have to work hard those, on those days because, they can, because there are cars in the way. So it's, it's a good solution. I, I, it's, I, a, it's a New York solution, which, uh, again, I, I, it could not be adopted at the level of the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, much as I'm loath to leave a conversation that uh, privileges parking and religious change, <laughs> uh, I, I, I feel obliged to, 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 to move the conversation on. Um, we've been speaking in, in some detail, as we, um, as we should be, about those roughly 11 million or so Muslims who are living in France, Germany, the UK, um, Holland, Spain. Uh, the scale of the immigration, uh, particularly when combined with both demographic growth as well as the events that have taken place, particularly the last decade or decade and a half, uh, these have occasioned and excited sometimes even a, a kind of febrile literature. There are some infamous uh, or well-respected books, depending on one's perspective, uh, Christopher Caldwell, Bruce Bauer, the title of the latter's, While Europe Slept how radical Islam is destroying the West. The latter, Bauer, writes uh, this about the Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh, who was murdered by a Muslim extremist in November of 2004. He writes, unlike most Europeans, he had understood the connection between the war of terror, the war on terror, excuse me, <coughs> and the European integration crisis, and had called America, quote, the last beacon of hope in a steadily darkening world. Tarek, you're a, a very keen observer of the politics of Islam and the politics of immigration and in the UK in particular. Um, could you speak briefly to this kind of apocalyptic uh, uh, vision of, of a Europe darkening um, because of a almost willful ignorance of, of, demographic, uh, of the demographic threat of yeah. Muslims? Well, I, th I think there are, there are really... Um, two or three different issues here. I mean, one is demography, and the other is the kind of clash of civilizations type discourse. So I have, I have very little um, time for, very little sympathy for the clash of civilizations perspective on, on, on this, because I, 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 I don't think that is, that is true about the world as a whole, and it's not true about um, Europe. But the demography is worth just looking at in its, for its own sake because much as um, some of us might not like the fact or want to uh, admit the fact, um, right-wingers sometimes are right about demography. In um, the late 60s, we had a, a senior conservative politician called Enoch Powell who raised issues about race at a national level, under a kind of, you know, central political level, and actually lost his job in, in the shadow cabinet because of it and became infamous because of it, but also very popular uh, with uh, some white people in the country, with many white people in the country, actually. Um, now, he made two predictions, and, and in a way, they're very similar to the kind of the literature that you're referring to now, which now speaks about Europe. Powell was only talking about Britain. Prediction number one he made was he said, and this is, as I say, in the mid to late 60s, when the number of non-white people was something like a quarter of a million, or it may have been a few hundred thousand, I can't remember precisely, but it was very small. And um, in terms of percentage, that would have made it, um, about 2%, something like that. He said, 
you know, wake up England, you don't know what's happening, by the end of this century, there will be three and a half to four million non-white people in this country. And everybody, certainly, you know, academics, um, liberal newspapers and magazines and so on, they all said he was a complete alarmist. And they said, that just couldn't happen. Well, we had a census in 2001, and Enoch Powell got the figure very, mm. you know, just about right, actually. But he combined the demographic projection, uh, prediction with another prediction, and he said he saw himself as the Roman uh, on the bridge looking at the Tiber, foaming with blood, and he said, I predict race wars will take place in England because white people, and not because black people will start attacking white people, but because white people will say we've had enough. These people are ruining our country. They're taking over our country, or they're spoiling the country that we thought we had. And they will then react, and it'll be black blood that will be flowing in the Thames. Well, that didn't happen, and it's nowhere close to happening, and so on. So I feel a bit like that about these uh, European alarmists, or actually so many of them are Americans, but they're, they're trying to alarm Europe. They're trying to wake Europe up and say, hey, panic. You should be panicking. Um, but sometimes they completely exaggerate the demography as well. I ought to say that as well. I'm not saying every right wing is right about demography. Far from it. But sometimes they can, they can be right. Um, but I don't agree with uh, the clash of civilizations, which is a bit like the river foaming with blood type uh, projection. Um, but if we think of people of non-European descent, then there will be a significant proportion of the European population in a generation's time and by the middle of the century. There's, I mean, unless something you know, cataclysmic happens, there will be, because um, Europe needs new labor, so there'll be new migration coming, and North Africa is a prime site for uh, labor migration because it's demographically uh, exploding the other way, lots of young people without jobs, though of course Eastern Europe was partly brought into the European Union so that we could have you know, white labor coming in to help Western European aging population, and that has happened and will continue to happen as well, but it won't be enough. But also fertility rates, and the fact that the migrant population is much younger than the white population, and so they're exactly the people who are having children. Mm. And for all these reasons, so if you work, if you take these assumptions about new labor, about fertility, and various other things, it, it's quite likely that um, the large cities of Western Europe will, you know, just like a lot of American cities, w uh, white people will become part of a plurality rather than be part of a majority. But not all these non-European origin people will be Muslims. Of course not. In, in Britain, uh, Muslims are actually a minority amongst non-white people. They're roughly around 40%. Um, and uh, Christians are a minority as well because there are Hindus and Sikhs as well. So it depends on where you draw the line. Are you more concerned about race and color? Are you more concerned about Muslims, non-Muslims, or whatever? But actually, 21st century European cities will look more like 20th century American cities than like 20th century European cities. Ethnic, religious, and racial diversity has now been planted in European cities, especially in Western Europe. Cities like you know, Amsterdam, Brussels, London, Paris, Marseille, and one could, you know, a big long list of them. So the population won't be evenly mixed, but in terms of big urban concentrations, yes, white people will find that they are sharing those cities with people who are not white, but it doesn't mean that they'll be aliens or of another civilization. I don't think that would be true at all. Just as it, you know, people, any, any of you who visited places like uh, London will know that just because people aren't white doesn't mean they feel any less British. Mm. I think it will be a Europe like that. Well, we are starting to run out of time, but I want to, um, I want to ask a, 
abuse my authority in the chair here and ask a, a two-part question which, which should bring into focus some of the issues that um, we've been discussing and to some extent leads as a, can function as a transition to the next discussion uh, which will take place on April 20th. So the two-part question is this and, and I'll ask each of you to just respond. Uh, one trajectory of modern Islam, which is sometimes called Islamism or radical Islam, it's the Islam of the newspapers for the most part, is distinctive if not entirely unique in the sense that it makes political, overt political claims. And many of these claims seem to be on the face of things or even more deeply incompatible with the kind of values that we commonly associate with Western liberal democracies. A public religion, we're, we're used to, to privatized religion and, and there are well-established ways in which privatized religions uh, are consonant or compatible with uh, at least the prevailing uh, models of, of, of liberal societies. On the basis of the perceived incompatibility of Islam, it's sometimes argued that uh, since Islam is incompatible, uh, Muslims either cannot or are unwilling to integrate. So one question would be, do you agree with that? To what extent does that trajectory, that that particular model of Islam, of a public Islam, one which makes what are sometimes retailed as exclusive political claims, um, to what extent is that normative? Is that, does that prevail? The second closely related question is that there are alternative trajectories. There are different constructions of Islam. Um, Muslims, be they in Europe or in the United States, are subject not only to what is sometimes called the radicalizing influence of the Imams, but also to the moderating influences of others. And in the work of people like Tariq Ramadan and others, one can find the embryo of what sometimes is called the Euro-Islam. In other words, Islam is, um, is through its, or I should say, through Muslims' exposure to Western societies, new conceptions of Islam, new models of Islam are emerging. Where, uh, in that kind of balance, do you th see things? Um, are you fundamentally optimistic or pessimistic about uh, uh, the models of Islam that will prevail? Jose, maybe start with you and then Tarek and finally Ari. I'm an optimist, always. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that there are three different issues. One is the issue of the discourse on Islam is incompatible with democracy. What does it mean? The discourse on Islam today is very similar to the discourse on Catholicism in the 19th century. And the arguments used are exactly the same. It's a non-changing religion, essentially unchanging, uh, essentially undemocratic, illiberal, authoritarian, uh, traditional, and cannot really, really accommodate modernity. So this is the first argument. The second, they have these transnational loyalties, they have this Ayatollah in Rome, and they can never be good citizens because their primary identity is the, to the Ummah, to the Catholic Church. And third, they have these weird customs, these ideas, they can never become good Americans. So the arguments were exactly the same, and they were uh, basically dominant in the culture camp, not only in the United States, but in Great Britain, in Holland, in uh, Germany. So you have this conflict between Protestants and Catholics, and the argument against Catholicism was very similar to the argument against Islam today. It is not that there was no reason for the argument, there were some reasons, but fundamentally, at least history has shown, that things have changed. Nobody talks about Catholicism today in the same, term, in the same terms. Um, and of course, the discourse on Catholicism shaped the way Catholics responded to this discourse. So the, again, the question is the dynamic the discourse, discourse creates. Um, of course, Catholicism also had its political Catholicism in the 30s. It was very undemocratic, it was very pro-fascist, but something happened and you have a transition to Christian democracy, we forget that it was the Catholic Christian Democrats that basically established the European Union, basically very much uh, led also democratization in many of those countries after World War II. So this is something we have to take into account. Now, if you look around the Muslim world, of course, it's true there are a majority of Muslim countries that may have authoritarian regimes, but not necessarily because of Islam. I mean, there are other, I mean, there are other very promising developments in Indonesia, in Senegal, in Turkey, that show indeed that there is no necessary relationship and that developments could go in a different direction. 
Now, for me, because precisely my first encounter with Islam was with sisters in Islam in Malaysia, a feminist group, I never could have the notion that Islam is homogeneously fundamentalist. Precisely, I came there on a conference challenging uh, uh, fundamentalism, challenging both the fundamentalism within Islam, but also challenging the depiction of Islam as fundamentalist. And so, uh, it's simply we have to unpack those, those things. Uh, the fundamental difference, I would argue, between Catholicism and Islam is that in Catholicism, when things change, change radically, very fast, and homogeneously after Vatican II. And suddenly you have a process of democratization throughout the Catholic world that had authoritarian regimes. In the case of Islam, it goes in opposite directions. It's a very, very uh, pluralistic, internally pluralistic and diverse uh, uh, structure has no uh, hierarchic authority, so you will have both very pacifist and very aggressive, very violent, uh, feminist and misogynist uh, trends, liberal and very conservative. So there will be not one single direction and probably will have to live for a long, long time with very, very uh, contradictory manifestations of this transformation of Islam. Tariq, would, would things be simpler if, if, uh, if Muslims just got themselves a, a pope and a issued, uh, I issued uh, Vatican II and... and, and well, part, part of the problem with Islam is that it's just too democratic, isn't it? Mm. If only they could have one person speaking for them, life would be a lot easier. <coughs> um, I certainly don't think there's a, a fundamental <coughs> incompatibility between um, Islam and democracy. Um, Islamism that you referred to as a, a political movement or an <coughs> ideological movement is, of course, a very small minority movement. And s the people who are not democratically inclined within Islamism, forget about Muslims, but within Islamism, are now themselves a minority. Because in a way, what's happened is, if we, t if we take a parallel from uh, European ideological political experience, is that a certain kind of top-down socialism, you know, Leninist socialism has become social democratic, as it did, you know, in the middle of the uh, century, 20th century in Western Europe. So many Islamists who thought of themselves as working to much more uh, authoritarian models of politics have actually become democratic. And sometimes it's um, other people, including the the United States government that will not allow them to participate in democratic elections or, or not allow their, you know, allies um, uh, to accept them um, or put it the other way around. Their allies, like I'm thinking of people like, you know, President Mubarak of, of Egypt will uh, arrest various members of the Muslim Brotherhood and so on so they can't participate in elections and the United States makes no fuss what's whatsoever. And sometimes when uh, Islamists get elected into power, like Hezbollah in, in, in um, southern Lebanon, or Hamas in Gaza, or GIS in Algeria, Western powers freeze them out. They say, we can't possibly talk to you. Go and have another election and elect somebody else. Um, a poll conducted by uh, Gallup, you know, based, based in the United States, across um, the Muslim world, uh, virtually all, perhaps not all, but nearly all Muslim countries were a part of this uh, survey. Um, it, was, it was published in a number of ways, but in a, in a very interesting book called um, Who Speaks for Islam? And they found that there was no real difference in uh, support for democracy amongst Muslims and non-Muslims. And a, 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 on a number of those kinds of questions, you know, questions to do with democracy and so on, uh, and uh, issues about politics and religion, Muslims across the world, the closest parallel that they had, other non-Muslim group, were actually Christians in the United States. Their views were very similar to conservative Christians in the United States. So I would say that the one area where there is observable difference between um, views of majorities in European countries and majorities certainly in Muslim countries and possibly also 
uh, amongst Muslims in certain parts of Western Europe, though that's a little bit more difficult to determine, are really issues to do with gender, life-term marriages, sexuality. Those are the issues. So the question is, is Islam sufficiently liberal? Not is it sufficiently democratic? Most Muslims have no problems with democracy. They're, they're dying for it, you know, literally and in other ways. And Islamism itself really came to be a, a powerful movement because Muslims were fed up with corrupt, authoritarian, dictatorial, nepotistic governments who were supported by the West, who were often client states of the West, where the West was benefiting from resource, resources from those countries, above all oil, of course. That's part of the background conditions. The, in fact, I'd say not just background, the foreground conditions that has stimulated Islamism, which initially was much more of a kind of uh, Leninist type movement, but now has reconciled nearly all Muslim countries, Islamists have reconciled themselves with the ballot box because actually they think they can win. And on the whole, they're right. They can win. And it's the, what are referred to as the hereditary republics where, you know, if your name is Assad, you're more likely to rule than not, or Bhutto or Mubarak, people who want their sons and daughters to rule after them and won't allow elections. They're the people who are creating uh, the conditions for political conflict in those countries by not allowing democracy. So I don't think there's any problem between Muslims and democracy, but Muslims are likely to sit in the more socially conservative part of the political spectrum. All right, two, I think, fundamentally optimistic uh, projections. Yeah, I, I, I very much, uh, my outlook is very much like uh, Jose's, but I think that uh, there's going to be a great, uh, the way I think about it is that Islam, like Judaism, is very congregational. So there's no uh, central authority. Even though the French keep trying to transform it into a sort of a church kind of thing with somebody at the top so the president of France knows whose hand he, will, he has to shake on New Year's Day. But anyway, but it just isn't like that. And uh, since there's going to be very different circumstances, partly in terms of class. I mean, it's true that many Muslims in Europe are sort of uh, dep uh, in the more deprived segments of the population, but some are not. And I think it's going to become more diverse over time. So there will be very different adjustments of individuals and of families. I would bet that on the, the majority will probably uh, integrate fairly well and uh, sort of act like other groups have, namely uh, try to get uh, some representation on behalf of, uh, to protect their, their interests. For example, to get holidays recognized, things like that. <laughs> Which is a perfectly sensible thing to do. And to try to get things changed so that they're no longer sort of uh, on, the, uh, on the outside. But there will be some who will not make it in, into the society, who will be frustrated, and who probably will be drawn, as other, group, other people have, to more extremist solutions. So I think we should expect a mix. But I think, on the whole, I would bet, to the, I would bet on the positive side. Well, on it's partly a matter of choice. I mean, this, will, this is not a function of what, what Muslims do, but more of what, what the receiving society will do. So I think uh, it, it gives us some idea what the policy should be. Well, on that note, one of, how should I put it, shared responsibility. Um, we need to end uh, tonight's uh, very interesting conversation. I've learned a great deal. Um, uh, just a moment, please. Um, I have two requests to make. Number one, if you found uh, tonight's um, conversation as interesting as I have, then I would urge you to attend the upcoming conversation on the rise of intellectual reform in the Islamic world. It will feature, um, just as today's presentation featured uh, really leading scholars, so, till, so too will, will the upcoming one, Barbara Johansson, Ibrahim Musa, and Abdul Karim Sarouj. It will be moderated by my colleague Talal Assad. It will take place on Tuesday, the 20th of April at 7 p.m. The second request, again, if you found tonight's conversation useful, 
well, then you can put your money where your mouth is and buy some books, which are for sale outside. Books <laughs> written by my author colleagues. Thank you very much, and please do join me in thanking you. <laughs>